it's my pleasure to introduce our very special guest. New York Times bestselling author David L. Robbins has written 15 novels, four professionally produced plays, and in 2018 was named one of two most influential literary artists in the Commonwealth of Virginia for the past 50 years by the Virginia Commission for the Arts. His new historical fiction novel, Isaac's Beacon, is a sweeping tale based on the real events of Israel's founding, bringing alive the power and complexities of the birth of the Jewish state. David is the founder of the James River Writers, a nonprofit organization in his hometown of Richmond that helps aspiring writers and students work and learn together as a writing community. He also co-founded the Podium Foundation, a nonprofit which brings writing and critical reasoning programs to youth in the greater Richmond metropolitan area. In 2015, he founded the Mighty Pen Project, a writing program for Virginia's military veterans. Robbins lives and writes in his hometown of Richmond, Virginia, and teaches advanced creative writing at Virginia Commonwealth University. Please join me in welcoming David Robbins. Hi everybody, thank you for checking in. Hold on, I'm gonna move us to gallery. There we are. Ken Ockel, is that? That looks like Mike Get Ditka. <laughs> um, all right, thank you everybody. Um, so um, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I like to, um, I like to do sort of Socratic. I. I I would really prefer it if, <clears throat> while I'm talking, if you guys have questions or anything you'd like to know, um, if you've read the book or you're interested in, in the subject of the book, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I certainly prefer it if we, uh, we, we have questions. Is it, um, would it be troublesome to ask you guys to turn your cameras on? It's, um, it's difficult to talk to a bunch of black boxes. Um, is, that, is that, I don't want to inconvenience anybody if you're wearing you know, um, bunny slippers, but um, it, it is, uh, it's more fun for me, a little more interactive if we can see each other. Um, but I'll start anyway. Um, yeah, you know, um, look, you get used to this. I, I, I taught for two years um, during COVID at VCU, like, like, uh, like was said, and uh, the kids just wouldn't turn the cameras on. And, and I, uh, I, it, it's, it, I don't know, it's like talking in the shower. But, um, so I think the reason why I'm here is because you folks have a particular interest in the last book I wrote called Isaac's Beacon. Um, it is, uh, so I'll just leap in there. And, and, and again, uh, if there's questions, um, it will help me, you know, format my comments so that they're, 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 they fit your interest best. Um, so yeah, my name is David Robbins. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. It's 71 degrees outside and hallelujah. You guys are in Florida, you don't know what it's like. Um, I, most of you are probably New Yorkers anyway, but, but it, it, today is the first day where I, I stepped outside just said it's finally over. Like February is like the Kansas of months. It's this long flat thing you think you'll never get over. Um, so it, it's a beautiful day out and, and um, so I'll, I'll tell you what I did. So I, I'm Jewish. I grew up Jewish, and uh, I, I, um, I like everybody else read growing up, and then reread as an older fella um, Leon Uris's Exodus, which yeah I think a great many people have read, and and it was written in 1959, um, and uh, I think that it was a kind of an unapologetic Valentine to Israel. I, I don't have an issue with that. I'm not a polemicist, and I, I'm, my work is a political. But as I moved through my my professional writing career, I always had in the back of my mind wanting to write a story about the creation of Israel. Now, in my time, I've had a chance to write about the Battle of Stalingrad, um, the largest battle in history, mankind's history, which would be Kursk. I've written about the fall of uh, Berlin. I've written about D-Day. Uh, I took on a lot of very big topics, a lot of very big historical topics, and that's cramming a whole lot into the space of a book. 
I mean, when you're talking about a, a, a war that spans, as we so sadly know now, but a war that spans um, so many tens of thousands of lives and, and, and leaves such a mark in history, to, to think that you can reduce it down to the size of a book is, you know, let's face it, perhaps a, an, act of, an act of will as well as it is an act of ego. And I don't know that for those 15, 16 books that I published prior to this, that I could have written this book without having written them. I, I really feel that those th those prepared me because the the adventure of creating the state of Israel. The the um, let me preamble that first. I want to be real clear. I am I am not because I'm Jewish. I am not inordinately somehow and may you may not be either adhered to Israel. Um, it's a misnomer to think that because somebody's Irish. They favor Ireland over America. We're all American citizens. And this is this is all part and parcel. I think what drew me to this story is that it's the first homeland the Jew has had since Jerusalem in the year 79. It's a long time to wait. And I thought that the story um, needed to be told and be told in an updated sense. Um, I'm not throwing stones at Eurus, but he was fine for 1959. But to read the book today, you don't get... I think a real sense of the tumult and the, uh, the moral and political complexities that created the state of Israel. It, it wasn't, uh, and I'm not saying yours book is simple, uh, um, or isn't multifaceted, but it is a blatant apologia for Israel, for the state of Israel. And, and I don't know that, that, that Israel requires that uh, any more than America does. I don't know. Um, I think that the actual facts, of the creation of the state of Israel stand alone as as a remarkable adventure. Um, of course, it's rooted in it's it's rooted in a great many things. Uh, one of which is the Holocaust. One of which is uh, the British um, the British occupation of Israel, uh, the the revolt against the British, the, the civil war with the Arabs, and then of course inevitably the the first war with the Arabs, the 1948 war which was the subject of the sequel. I have written actually a sequel to Isaac's Beacon, and, and it encompasses the 1948 war. Um, so why did I write it? I, I felt that, um, why did I wait to write it? I didn't think I was a good enough writer, to be honest. I didn't think that I could take something the size of the creation of the state of Israel out of the ashes of the Holocaust and turn that into a book. It took, it took a long time and a lot of thinking, a lot of training for me personally, to get to where I felt that I could write that book, um, but I won't lie to you, guys. I think that I, I think, uh, since I can't see your faces, hold on, I just put it down. Since I can't see, it's hard to tell. But um, um, I guess, Mr. Sotowski, I, I can see you. Did you just see the book? I mean, um, can you have it? Okay. Um, now I can't hear you, and I don't know why my video is blinking on and off. But um, did um, did you have a chance to read it? Because if you did, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. Okay, yeah, I I I, I read it as soon as I signed on. I got the book and I read it, and I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, yeah, I I um, well, good. I'm. I, it helps me to know if there's any, you know, if I'm talking to people who have read the book who haven't read the book. Um, so it helps it helps to know that I that, that you have. And I'm going to figure out why my camera's blinking. But if you don't mind, I'd love to give you the chance to ask one of those questions and see where we can go with that. Maybe invite the others to do the same. And okay. My well, what, what what is a simple question? You said you wrote a sequel to this. Yeah. Um, well, okay. For those of you who haven't read it, you you. you you do know, uh, Esther, that, that the book stops on May 14th, 1948. Correct. Uh, with with Ben Gurion's creation of the State of Israel. Um, the second book literally starts 12 seconds later. Um, that night, um, th this is this is. Ah, I'm sorry about the camera, folks. Um, this is kind of one of the miracles of Israel is that they go from. Um, let's figure the pogroms start around 1932, 33. So we've got 
13, 14 years of pogroms and concentration camps. And then the war ends. The war ends on May 9th. On May 9th was the beginning of the revolt against the British, right, to get them out of Jerusalem, out of Israel. And then on, Mar on November 27th, 1948, mm -hmm. 1947, I'm sorry, the British announced, as, as you know in the book, the British announced that they're going to leave um, Israel, and Israel and the UN takes a vote that will allow the creation of the state of Israel. On the day of that vote, on the day that the British announced they're leaving, a civil war started with the Arabs, the, the Arab Palestinians. That civil war lasted until May 9th, 1948, I mean, May 14th, 1948, when Ben Gurion announced the creation of the state of Israel. And on that day, without even hours of break, that day, that evening, the tanks of five Arab nations came across Israel. And so they had literally, literally nothing but hours over the course of 20 years, only hours between conflicts, right, to basically sweep up the confetti. Um, so the, the second book. Um, sorry, four, five, up, zero, zero, let zero, me get rid of this phone. Four, of course. Okay, sorry. Welcome back. Um, all right, so the second book literally begins with the invasion of, uh, of Israel by uh, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Transjordan, and Egypt that night, and follows through the, uh, the Arab-Israeli War of 1948-49. And, and uh, for those of you who have read the book, maybe you'll be familiar, but the, um, I keep Rivka and Vince and Hugo as characters but I also elevate Rivka's sister, Gabby, you call her, yeah. and I elevate her and Malik to character status. So we see a great deal of the Arab, um, the Nakba, you know, when they, were, when they, when they left. What they call the Nakba, yeah. What they call the Nakba, yeah. We see that through, uh, through Malik's eyes. Um, so the book, the, the, the second book kind of keeps that same epic sweep. Um, and I was very pleased with it. I, I, uh, my, um, you know, my editor Saul Bellow's son, Adam, interesting. Really? Yeah, because growing up, Saul Bellow was my favorite writer. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool to have his son as my editor. Um, so um, are, there, are there any questions coming through, or should I just keep yakking? Um, I'll yak. Well, unless, Esther, you have another question. Can yeah, OK. Uh, I, I, I heard what you said, and I heard what you said about Leon Yuris. I was in fifth grade when I read the book, and then the movie came out, and it was a big deal. I mean, we really didn't have money to spare, but my entire extended family all got dressed up, and we all went into Manhattan to see the premiere of the movie, and it was a big deal. And while, of course, it was romanticized, but I think Jewish people needed it at that point after being whacked and, and beaten and tried to wipe off the face of the earth not that long be before that in the Holocaust. Um, I think they needed to feel pride that they could actually do something, that they could fight and reestablish a home, a state of Israel. Um, I so I understand the romanticizing of it. However, and this is not personal. I take exception to the fact that you equated Der Yassin and the slaughter that went on at Gush. Do you mind if I ask a question back? How 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 do you feel I equated them? I certainly justified. Yeah, you you justified. You said that basically that the the slaughter at Gush Etzion uh, took place because of Dar Yassin. It did. It's a historical fact. I didn't make that up. The the uh the people that the 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 the, the Arab the Arab the, the, the Transjordanian the Egyptian army throughout the entire war shouted Dar Yassin at, at whenever they would uh, engage in battle with the, with with the Israeli army. I don't know that that's equating them. Yeah, yeah, okay. It just No, it's fine. I, it's it's fine. just that if you go back uh, while they were being slaughtered in Europe from 1933 on, 
1929, there was a horrific pogrom in Hebron. Yep. Hebron. Um, where so many Jews were slaughtered and thrown out. And you never, never, never read of that. So should we say that Der Yassin was justified because of that? Or it was what I hope was an aberration, not an excuse for people to. Yeah. Certainly, look, I'm not trying to quibble terms. And I think this is a lovely discussion. I would never say that slaughter or that kind of violence is ever justified. I, I don't, I hope I certainly would never give the impression that anything's justified, but you want to explore as a novelist, as, a, as, as you know, as, as, a, as an historical fiction writer, you want to explore motivation. That's the advantage I have that a documentarian doesn't have. Documentarian is li limited to only what happened. I, as, as a fiction writer, get to explore motivation. Um, I don't, I don't know that I equated them, but I think it's absolutely historically accurate that, that the, the, the massacre of Gush Etzion was a reprisal for, um, for Darius Sin. Um, Darius Sin was the, um, and it was one of several, um, one of several massacres, um, one of several massacres of, of various scale executed by both parties. Um, the, the, the IDF, um, there, there were, I, I, I couldn't give you a number, but it was double digits of, of recorded uh, episodes of what could easily be called war crimes. And the Arabs did the same thing. Did you know, just parenthetically, that the bodies at uh, um, Gush Etzion, at, well, Kfar Etzion, were not allowed to be recovered until the end of the war? They stayed, in the, they stayed on the open ground for a year and, you know, like a year. <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's, but see, that's the kind of thing that wasn't in that kind of violence and that kind of tumult and that kind of brutality, frankly, <clears throat> wasn't in. And I thought it was, I thought it was good and appropriate to write a book that had a more un, <clears throat> unvarnished view of the kind of violence and the kind of um, that each party visited on the other. I mean, I, essentially, though, I, I don't. I hope I did not take any view that would equate or justify. Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read again some of the portion, you know. Okay. Well, I, I um, for instance, you'll go ahead, Esther. Okay, do, do you think it serves, I, I know you're a novelist and I, I, I love reading books, okay? Of course. Um, do you think it serves a purpose to sometimes take the shine off of something? and expose it to corroding air? Well, certainly the way you ask the question, um, it jades the air. <laughs> it tells me what answer you're looking for. <clears throat> um, when you put it like that, only a fool would walk into that trap. Um, <laughs> no trap, so let, man. Yeah, let me, let me, if you don't mind, let me take a shot at recrafting the question. Um, if the unvarnished facts um, lead us to greater insights about ourselves. Um, if, if, if the, I have no use for myth. I, and, and, and for instance, I have no use. Um, one of the reasons why I wrote this book and I intend to write, I just finished, like I said, the next one, and I intend to write the, the, the Suez war and the seven war and then the 73 war. And then, um, my goal here is to do exactly what you just said, is to, is, to, is to study the facts, study the records, which are far more complete now than when yours wrote, right? Um, and let people just, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I'm not comfortable being told that Israel is an apartheid state. I'm not comfortable hearing that Israel is a, an illicit state. I'm not comfortable hearing that is all and for the Palestinians or not. Um, those things, they turn out to be not historically true. Um, the, um, we could use the Nakbar as an example. My surgeon, my eye surgeon's a Palestinian fellow, very clever man, Harvard educated, great surgeon. And I stupidly made the mistake of engaging him in this conversation, which I would advise you to do if, you're, if your surgeon is 
an Arab or Palestinian. And he told me that his grandfather had been, um, had been run out of his country. And I asked him what was the name of his country. He said, Palestine. I said, Palestine was a territory administered by first Rome, then the Ottomans, then the British, you know, and now the Jews. There's never been a country named Palestine. There is no government of Palestine. There is no president of Palestine. And I said, and, 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 I, and I had to inform him, I said, you understand, your grandfather was not a citizen of any state. He wasn't. There was no state called Palestine. And that's just one of the 10,000 myths. Um, the Palestinian people have been offered their own state seven times. Seven times they've said no. And seven times they've said we will not acknowledge any document that, that, that acknowledges the existence of the state of Israel. Now that said, and that's, that's not judgment, I, my point, that's a fact. Um, here, you've, you've, I, I'm going to assume you've been to Israel, you've visited, visited Israel. Many, um, many times. Then, then, you know, then you know that if out of the 9 million people that live in Israel, 3 million are Arab Muslim. And they're right. Israeli citizens, right? Yes, they are. And, and they go to the universities and they work in the schools and the hospitals. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to address the quality of their lives uh, as Israeli. I say that they are fully citizens. Every single own protection and I cannot for the when I'm going to unplug something see if that helps my uh, my camera let me see if that helps I apologize for that I don't know it's acting up on a lovely day um, so what we know Esther is this is that an Arab can live in a Jewish run state but that a Jew is a difficult time living in an Arab run state right now and I could go on in this vein for a while um there's a great deal of myth, part of which is Darius Sin, part of which is Kfar Tzian, part of which is the depopulation of Lida and Ramla, on and on and on. Um, I'm not a polemicist. My job is not to make you feel good or bad about Israel or the Palestinians. My job is to invest you in three characters, right? And have you care about their adventure. What they see is all I care about you see. I'm not here. I'm not here to make a political statement or judge. Uh, uh, or judge history, but I am here to give you the uh, the tools to, to make informed decisions insofar as historical fiction can provide that, right? Now, I will tell you this, everything you read in that book is, is, is true, checked, and cross-referenced. There's not a name, there's not a date, there's not a time that didn't happen. Even if, it, even if it's done by one of my fictional characters, it was done by somebody. Someone. Um, yeah. For instance, one of my favorite scenes is when Hugo is leaving the uh, leaving Buchenwald. He's leaving Weimar, and remember that he's with a crowd of people who see the, the the Nazi guard and they talk him into hanging himself. Remember that scene? And that happened. I found a portrayal of that. Yeah, um, that that was amazing. I I hadn't heard that. Yeah, that was um, that was written by. Uh, uh, um, a, a reporter named I.F. Stone who witnessed that. Um, so I, I, I guess I can say I'm sorry if you feel that I, I was morally equivocating in the book. I, I certainly never intended to. I, um, but, it, but I'm not going to shy away from the fact that every single, um, every single bullet that was fired at, 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 at Gush Etzion was for Darius Sin. It just was. Um, whether that's an truth with my hand. Um, okay. so, do, do, do you think, so obviously I'm Jewish. Um, do you think that um, an Arab, I don't care from whichever country, um, would read this book and see it differently other than I do or other than you do? Sure. Why? For, for secondly, why would I want that for them? Or, or I mean, I. Um, and, and then, and then maybe a third answer, Esther, is perhaps not because again, the book is not about Israel. It's about three it's about three people. 
Yeah, it's set in that time. But I'm not trying to use the, use the background, as I say, as a polemicist. I'm not. I just found, I found the miracle of the creation of the state of Israel to be so, so remarkable in such vivid and fertile territory that I thought three really interesting characters could um, set out to do, and that's all I ever set out to do. So the book is not, if I wanted to write about Israel, I would write about Israel. You know, but they, they don't. That's not. A, they don't need me in that role. That's that's being done well. You know. Well, Wu kind of did that with his uh, trilogy and the hope and the glory. Yeah, you... I, it, it's um, I, I. But you know, you can't pick up a book and read about Dear Yassin, though. You you can't. No. Uh, and you, and no. you can't pick up a book and read about Kfar and Sion. You can't. Um, the uh, even down to the point where you know at the end when Rivka survives. Um, because it, uh, it turns out to be Malik, but an Arab guard comes in and shoots the two guys who are about to, you know, that happened. The the one woman that survived, Farzian, was being dragged out of a ditch into the, into the trees, and I, I, I went there, and an Arab officer came out and shot these two guys with a Thompson machine gun. And so I built the character Malik just to play that role at the end and to save Rivka. Um, but no, I, 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 I'm going to stand my ground on this one, Esther. I, 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 if I can be accused of being a polemicist, then, then, then that's an argument I'd like to have. But if, if all I did was put three characters into a, a very trying environment to find out who they are and test their love for each other and their humanity, that's all I set out to do. And I, I, I think the book did that. Um, now, yeah, you've done it very well. Well, thank you. I, it, I won't argue that. And if it made you think of other things, you know what? I consider that a bonus. Um, well, I, I I appreciate that you that you uh, wrote it. And then I'm going to do something that most authors don't like. Uh, come Pesach, Passover, I'll be with my family, and I'm going to pass the copy around <laughs> instead well, of buying. Do Recommend it. Don't. Yes. <laughs> I have friends who tell me that. I have friends who say, oh my God, I borrowed your book. I go, why would you borrow? Who do you think pays for this expensive camera that keeps blinking in and out? <laughs> Don't lend my book, hold it out, show it to them and go, get your own. Get you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Come on. That's All right. I hope there's somebody else. I don't want to hog this whole thing. I mean... I, I, um, are we getting any questions? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what to talk about. I don't want to talk about myself, and, and, and uh, I don't know how interesting that could be. But I, I'd like to know if the other people read the book or if they had questions as well. Um, There's three chats. Um, but I don't think that uh, I don't think we've elicited. I don't think that our our sword play elicited any curiosities. That's right. I thought we I thought we might. But come on, guys. Um, you don't want to hear me and, and 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 Mr. Robin speak the whole time. Well, you know what? Ask me one more question, and then if and if that doesn't uh... ask you one more question. Well, okay. This is about it. I obviously it refers to the book. As an author, and in this case, as a Jewish author, or as an American, when you write about D Day or anything. Do you think that you can fully divest yourself of all of this and come out as a blank person writing this with no personal opinion? Oh yeah, I, that's that's not only easy to do. You can't be a writer if you can't do it. Um, I have no I have no stake whatsoever in the United States winning World War II. <laughs> they end up winning, but I don't have a personal stake in it. Uh, the reason for that is, Esther, because I'm not writing about Israel. I'm not writing about World War II. I'm writing about the characters. And and these make really good backdrops, really good settings. But look, I do a lot of teaching. So let me, let me lapse into teaching mode for a moment. There's two kinds of truths. Um, and I'll just restrict it to, let's say, narrative fiction. But I think there's two kinds of truths in the, in the world. But in, in narrative fiction and narrative storytelling, two kinds of truths. There are actual truth, and this is, this is an Aristotelian thing. Aristotle tells us there's actual truth and there's profound truth. 
And the actual truth is that truth defined as that truth which is the opposite of which is always false. And two plus two is five. That's always wrong. Never going to be right. There's one actual answer, and it's always going to be four. Profound truth is that truth, the opposite of which is also true. So the opposite of love is indifference. The opposite of courage, courage is cowardice. The opposite of, you know, of, of hurrying is leisure. The opposite of angst is calm. And they're all true. Now, here's the secret sauce. Here's the key. Is that actual truths Hello. make us different, right? Nice um, I don't share your name. I don't share your house. I could describe the room you're in, the house you live in, all actual truths. Those are yours and privately yours. But if I were to go into profound truths, then we might share them. We both had mothers and fathers. We both lost friends. We both have a, an interest in, at worst in, in, in our, our Jewish roots in, in Israel, on and on and on. Now, here's the thing. Actual truths make us different. Profound truths make us the same. Profound truths are the bridge. So when I write, my focus is on primarily profound truths. Now, I need actual truths to form the building box of the story, the time, the setting, the place, the characters, the descriptions, right? The action, the, the date, May 9th, May 14th, the year, the place, the episodes, the, the armaments, the caliber of a gun. That's all actual truths. But they're all things that I never experienced because they happened in 1940 through 1948. But... If I'm writing about love, well, we've all loved. If I'm talking about loss, grief, uh, joy, right, worry, um, all that stuff, all that stuff is things that we don't have to immediately experience, yet we can we can share, we can still emote. The scene where uh, Hugo and Vince go through the um, the uh, the displaced persons camp, where they're signing, where they're putting their names on the wall, right? You remember that? Now that's not a place you or I, thank God, have ever been. Yeah, don't tell me you, you couldn't feel that scene. You know, when, when Hugo, for the first time, is holding an identification paper that says, because he's had a number in Buchenwald and in the other camps for four years, and he's been given back his name. Now, that's obviously, thank God, never happened to us, but you can feel that. So you see the difference between profound and actual truths. If I'm worrying, if I'm, if I'm using the tools of actual truths to, as a gateway to profound truths, then Israel and, and the war and Kfarzion and, and, and all those awful and wonderful things are nothing other than platforms and perches from which I try to reach out to you and try to touch you. I can't touch you with a gun. I can't touch you with a truck or a bus or a date, you know, or a speech, but I can touch you with your heart or your experiences. Definitely. Ergo, I don't make that much, I don't, I work very, very hard to get the facts right. And that's the easy part. As to the easy part is to, is to understand what happened. The difficult part, the talent, the difference between me and somebody who's not a good writer, to be honest, is not the ability to marshal facts. It's the ability to imagine and express emotion and experience and hope. That, Therein lies. So no, I, I don't get attached to whether or not we beat the we beat the Nazis or the Nazis beat us or who wins and who loses. That's just that's in a book somewhere. You know that's what happened. I throw everything I got into making it plausible that Riv convinced fall in love. Okay, so you know that it's almost the opposite now of of what you're saying. If you're going to use Aristotle, I'll just ask you, what about the people who live in Plato's cave and they perceive things as facts and truths that are manifestly not so? And you have so much garbage out there now in the world of books where people do write books with the intent of convincing people to follow their delusions or their lies and you just shifted place. Um, it's just so different from what you're trying to do. It, it doesn't get you angry. It does me. I want to throw some books at some people. Well, thank God I'm not a young man. I don't have to live a lot longer with all this nonsense. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I hear you with that, Esther. Out of my hands. You know, um, 
I, I, um, we live in a world now where people delegate too much of their own, I think their own personal responsibilities. I think too many people to, uh, allow themselves to be told what to think. Um, I can remember the days, I can remember the days when, when uh, Walter Cronkite would finish the news and you remember he would turn to another camera, he would put his elbow on the table and it would sunder his arm, it would say commentary. And he would say this reporter, and you would know this is this is Walter's opinion. It was separate from the news, you know. Uh, um, Dan Rather would say, um, you know, in this reporter's opinion. But you know, that's so. I don't. Um, but look, let's face it. You're nobody's fool, and you're not spring chicken. Neither am I. I'm not. It's not that easy to pull the wool over my eyes. You know why? Because I'm not just watching Fox News, and I'm not just watching uh, CNN. I'm reading Reuters, I'm reading Al Jazeera, I'm reading the Post, I'm reading the Times, I'm reading the Chronicle, <clears throat> I'm reading, you know, the Financial Times. I, you can't fool me because I'm, I'm getting my news from too many sources. Um, and so, yeah, if you, I'll put it to you this way. If you're a fool, you're living in, you're living in paradise these days because <laughs> there's plenty for you out there. Um, when you and I grew up, if you were That's a fool, bad. people would brand you a fool. Today, yeah, you can back it up. You know, you can you can get away with being a fool. But I, I don't, um, I don't engage those people. I don't write for those people. I write for you, Esther. I write for somebody who has an opinion and a background and knows what she's talking about and doesn't loan her favorite writer's books out. Wow, well, I appreciate that. And when is yes? <laughs> when is your second book coming out? You know, um, the- I, um, I think fall. It's oh. called the short. It's called the shortest road. Um, so there's a quote from King Farouk, who I, I I'll have to paraphrase, but he said the you know the epigraph at the beginning of the book says um, that this is a fight between um, the Jews and and the Muslims, and that young Muslim men from around the Islamic kingdom are coming to destroy the Jews, and they see it as the shortest road to heaven. I went okay. <laughs> There's your title. Um, yeah, so the name is The Shortest Road. Um, okay. And then I think the next one is going to be the uh, 1956 uh, Suez Canal. Uh, so you're going battle. through the whole, th- the whole thing. Well, All right. that, but that's my goal here. My goal is so that you, a good and informed and intelligent person, can read all five books and know. I'm just trying to separate fifth myth, myths from fact, right? Um, well, all I can say is my mother used to say I should live so long. <laughs> <laughs> Another four books. I'll show them, right? Yeah, we should all. Yeah. Um, the um, um, I'm kind of at a loss. I mean, I, I I'm enjoying talking to you, but I don't. Rita and Sheila. Um, I think I think um, you had a question. Someone did. I, I do have a question here Good. as a library worker. <laughs> um, I know you're very busy researching. I know that and writing your books, but what is the last book that you read that you would recommend to us personally? A book that you liked, that you enjoyed? Oh, um, now us, now when you say us, you mean this community or your whole community? No, we'll do a, a, this community here right now. Um. You know, if you really like historical fiction written by a masterful hand, I would say The Orphan Master's Son. Um, it's about North Korea, and it's it's just spectacular. Um, really just, just mind-bogglingly spectacular. Um, but I'll tell you, if, 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 so if you guys are like me, during COVID, you got addicted to television, because I couldn't go anywhere and I couldn't read all day long. So I started watching television and surprise, there was great stuff on TV and you could stream like nine, 10, 11 episodes and then three seasons of some show and just dive into it. So I picked up a Netflix addiction. Um, and I my cause I'm a reader. I'm like, I'm like these folks, right? They belong to a library. Um, uh, so, so I, I'm a reader like everybody else. My thing is nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, you know, out on the porch, cigar, book in my lap, read till midnight, put out the cigar, go to bed. That's my night, right? 
But then during COVID, you couldn't go out during the day. So I, I would do my reading during the day. And at night, I'd go, well, I can't keep freaking reading. So I turned on the television. Well, a year went by. I hadn't read two books. Milwaukee had read 30, but like, you know, for my work, but I hadn't read two for me. So I, uh, last year on my birthday, um, which was March 10, which was also last week as well. But last year on my birthday, I made a, I stopped watching television, but I punished myself. I said, okay, I am not, I am going to read the hardest books I can find as my punishment for spending a year. So I read a 1300 page biography of Napoleon which I must tell you was exquisite. Ex uh, un I read Obama's uh, Promised Land, you know, uh, which just uh, argue left and right what kind of president he was. I have my opinion, you have yours, but he's a wonderful chronicler of what it's like to be a young black president. I mean, it was, it was, it was magnificent. I read a survey of the world's 12 great religions, like, like that, like some tome. Um, I just went through a whole bunch of, like 1100 page books to punish myself for a year <laughs> watching Netflix. Um, but I, I, I know you have a lot of young readers. Let me recommend a book um, by a woman named Suzanne Cokel, C-O-K-A-L. And it, the book is The Kingdom of Small Wounds. Um, takes place in 14th century Denmark. And um, a remarkable, remarkable piece of style. Beautifully, beautifully written book. Um, of small what? The, the Kingdom of Small Wounds by Suzanne Cokel, C-O-K-A-L. Um, uh, just, just a wonderful, it won a Prinzler Award. Um, um, just, I mean, just an, an amazingly imaginative book. One of my four or five best books ever. But if you want to read historical fiction, um, the best thing I've read for a while is The Orphan Master's Son. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm still addicted to Netflix and I'm not planning on punishing myself anytime soon, at least not in that way. 1300 pages. <laughs> <laughs> but Napoleon, trust me, Napoleon, that was an amazing read. Um, anyway, but yeah, I, I um, but yeah, Esther, to your to your to your point, Mike. Here's a, let me ask you a question: How many? And you may know the answer to this because you read Isaac speak. But I I don't speak to anybody who knows the answer to this question. How many Jews made it from May 9th, 1945, when the war was over, to Israel by May 14th, 1947, the crisis state of Israel? How many Jews made it from Europe to to uh, Palestine, which became Israel. Most people would say, sorry, go ahead. I, say, I couldn't give you an exact figure. I don't know that anybody has the exact figure unless it's buried somewhere in one of the file drawer in a back room um, in Israel. But I would say thousands because they got chips and they just loaded them on and they, then they offloaded them and many of them were sent directly into, into, into the battlefield. The answer is 11,000. 11, where'd you get that number? You asked me to come up with a number I found three, four years ago when I wrote the book, but it's 11,000 because, wow. because the British, because the British interdicted them all. Uh, yeah, but that was when, when Israel, the state did not have permission because it wasn't a state yet, but once yeah, they yeah, had, that's, yeah, that's oh, I mean, that's why the 9th to the 14th, my yeah. bad. Yeah. But yeah. but in those, but in those in those three years between the end of the war and the creation of the state of Israel, when I give talks, people say, "Oh, a million, like oh, five hundred thousand, no, no, eleven thousand, yeah. and one hundred and ten thousand were put behind barbed wire in Madagascar and Cyprus, right? And th More this is the that. British, yeah. So so it's these kind of myths that I'm trying to dispel with these books. You know, we talk about the the Nakba. Um, and the Palestinians will tell you, well, they were driven out by the Jews. And the fact is, that's only one of five reasons. And it's not the predominant reason why they left their homes. They left their homes for the same reason Ukrainians are leaving their homes right now, because there was a war in their backyards. Right. Jews didn't run them off. They left because five Arab nations invaded Palestine, invaded Israel, and, they, and, and, these, and these 
Arab nations told them, get out of the way. There's 400, 000, there are 400 million Arabs, there's 500,000 Jews. We'll win this in a week. And then you could come back. And then you can come back. Well, it turns out that they lost. And here's the thing. So I ask people, and Esther, you might know this as well, but after reading the book, but you've been, you've been to Israel, so you've seen the Gaza Strip, right? I what? The Gaza Strip. Yes. Right? Now think about the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is four miles wide, 35 miles long of some of the best real estate on the Mediterranean. In a, in a country run by the world's great merchant class, right? Jews. How can, re, how can oceanfront real estate be the Gaza Strip? How did that happen? And I can't find three people that know the answer. And the answer is because when the war was over, the Egyptians left the refugees behind. The Egyptian right. army were told by King Farouk, when you, once now that you've lost, when you come home, they don't come with you. <clears throat> the West Bank, 300,000, which is now 1.5 million, Palestinians living on the West Bank. Why? Because King, King Husseini of Jordan said, they do not come with you. You went to fight a war, you lost, come back across the Jordan and slam the door. 300,000 Arabs living in the Golan Heights. Why? Because Syria and Lebanon went home after the war and took no refugees with them. Right. And so when my Surgeon tells me this is the Jews' fault. I got to say, I'm not trying to judge here. I'm just saying history doesn't bear that out, right? So that's why I'm writing these books, not as a polemic, not as an apologia, not as a valentine, but to say, hey, read these. And then I, I'm, a believer in, I'm, I'm a believer in American exceptionalism. I am. We come from that generation, right? I believe that we can be honest brokers. I believe that we can through... Um, through, through our, let's just say, uh, democracy and what we consider our Western values. I believe we can be an honest broker in the world, but we can't if we're, if we're ignorant of the facts. We can't get between the Palestinians and the Jews. We can't get between the Ukrainians and the Russians. We can't get between any two warring or arguing parties if we don't know, right? So I'm surrounded by people who want to tell me that Israel is an illicit state. Or they want to tell me that the Palestinians are evil. You know, they pick a side. And I go, well, I'm not going to tell you what side to pick, but I will tell you, read, read the facts. And I try to put the facts in the palatable lozenge of historical fiction, you know, and say, well, here, here's a whole bunch of facts for you, wrapped in a cool, fun story. And then I think you can put the book down and go, I'm much better informed. Because when the Palestinians are in dudgeon, they're not mad about 12 people being run out of an apartment in Jerusalem. They're mad about 1948. And you can't find anybody outside the State Department who knows anything about 1948 anymore. So that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I didn't write it in the Argo of, of, of Eurus. He served his purpose exactly as you say, Esther. I read it for the same reasons. And I was proud uh, and, and the book was discussed. Um, but I think that time has passed. And now I think candor is what's needed. Um, and, and, and I think that we need to know about various sins because the Palestinians know about it, right? And so I had to put it in the book. I, I, I had to, as you say, expose it to the corrosive, uh, the corrosive light of day and, and, and the moistness of, of, of fresh air. I had to because the Palestinians know about it. Last anecdote, I go to buy a new car. I live in Richmond. We have, you know, I love my city. We're a very welcoming city. We've got Afghans, we've got Hondurans, we've got Palestinians. So there's, there's good migrant communities in, in my city. And, I'm, and the, um, the, 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 the finance director of the dealership is a Palestinian guy. And I sat down and, and, he, and I made conversation. I said, so where are you from? He says, Hebron. I went, oh, I was in Hebron this time last year. I have a conversation. So I said to him, and this is very sad. I said, so have you heard of Dear Yassin? And Esther, I swear to you, he went just like this. He says, Dave, who has not? And my buddy, nobody. That, and that, that gesture right there, when he, a Palestinian with his ethic, says to me, who hasn't heard of this? And I go, nobody here. That's why I wrote these books. So that when this man says somebody to, says to you, Dear Yassin, you go, I know, I know. 
I know why it happens. I know what happens. I know what happened after. That's what I'm trying to do through the convention of historical fiction. And so for then you, you need some people to interpret. Yes, I hear yeah. you. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. That's good. All right. But you got to write them faster. Now I'm 73. I can't wait for another. How many? Four more books. Twelve more years. You only got to get to. You only got to get to. Uh, I'll make you a deal. I'll make you a deal. You show me a sales receipt from one of your relatives, and I will. I will send you. I will send you a PDF. I will send you. Uh, I'll email you the um, the sequel. You can read it for free. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. You can co-host the next Writers Live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to see. I, I, I didn't see read. The, I can do. I can do, Mr. Robbins. I didn't read the next one. Yeah, but I want to see a sales receipt for one book. You'll read oh. the, You'll you'll co-host Mr. Yeah. Robbins' next one. <laughs> yeah. Only no, I'm, I, I'm just thinking. How, how do I get? Normally, I bring my book, and you know, you guys would sign it, but. You want to sign it? I'll put it through the screen. Um, I'll, um, <laughs> well, you will. How do we work that out? Um, tell you what, you you um, let Chris Janklo, uh, 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 Janklo, you let we them have know. We have your email, I believe. Yeah. If you signed yeah. up with the email, yeah. If you if you guys want signed copies, work it out with the Palm the Palm Beach Library system, and we'll make it happen. Okay. I, do, do do I get this back or are you going to make me buy an extra copy? I don't know. What would you do? <laughs> well, if you're ethical, you should send <laughs> it back. No, you bought one. You bought one, but I want to see a receipt from somebody in your in your family. Okay. I mean, I, my, my daughter buys a lot of books and my okay. son-in-law. Right. So I'll That's tell good. them. Yeah. Um, no, I'll send I'll send Chris my mailing address and any 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 books you want signed. Send it to me, and we'll we'll make sure you get it back. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but recommend I, it. I will definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I think they'll they'll enjoy it. Good, thank you. Um, now, last question. Politics aside, did you feel it was well written? Yes, I did. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have slogged through. My my philosophy now is. I don't have time to waste on books that, you know, like you have to get into it. No, I don't. Right. You know, you have to develop a taste for it. No, I don't. I and agree. I went through it and I didn't feel like I was slogging. Good. So, That's all yes. But I didn't read all your prior books. They're all written as, as, as novels, all of them. Uh, yes, ma'am. They're all novels. Oh, now I have that pressure. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Robbins, can I jump in? Better late than never. Uh, I just please. want to ask a more goodness, yes. question. If I may. Please. Um, first of all, I'd like to know um, if you made multiple travels to Israel and doing your research. And also, when did you start writing? I, I like to always hear a little bit about like the rituals of writers. And do you, do you tend to write every day or what are your methods? Great questions. Question number one. Um, Yes, I was able to, uh, Isaac speaking is the result of a trip I took to Israel in 20, uh, 2019. Um, and so I, I went to all the places. Um, sadly, the, 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 the shortest road, this sequel is the only book I've ever written in my 15, 16 books that I did not go to those places. Um, the book takes place significantly uh, in the Golan area and I had not been there. So I had to, um, I had to rely a lot on on um, on just being in other places in Israel. But 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 yes, I'd say typically I always go to the places uh, that I write about. And I've I've sat in some cool places. I've sat on um, hilltops in Belarus. I've I've sat on uh, I've been on tank battlefields in the in in, in, in the Russian steppe. Um, I mean, I, I've scuba dived in the Bay of Pigs, so it's it's I, I've I've gotten to go some places that tourists just don't care to go, <laughs> you know. And I it's not for the first time. I, I I I about four years ago, I spent three weeks camping out with um, uh, Zulu um, Zulu uh, um, park rangers in the uh, in the Kruger in South Africa, 
because yeah, I wrote a book cool. about writing. Very cool. Yeah, that was that was crazy. And if you there was a so about one o'clock in the morning, I heard a lion roar, and I said to the guy next to me, I said, "So what? That's a lion, right?" He goes, "Oh, don't worry, he's th three miles away." I went, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, that that was three miles." He goes, "Oh, oh yes." I mean, these was a lion. So he was like four feet away. So you can imagine how <laughs> the lungs and. I, it's exhausting. Um, I go, I go hard for a long time, and I have a motto. I, you know, I have, read. I have a an uncanny ability that the day I can, the day I start a book, I can tell you within five thousand words, and usually less, how long it'll be. I I know a story for its length. Um, the book you, Isaac's Beacon, is one hundred twenty four eight. And I guessed 125 the day I, I missed by 200 words. So now I, is okay. So that's that's the the length. But how about the the amount of time it takes you to actually write it? How long did it take you to write this book? That book took me nine months, nine, nine months of of probably eight months of first drafting and six weeks of editing. You know, because the the first version when I was done was 140. Out of it. Um, so sorry, folks. Deeply apologize. Ah, uh, technology. Hold on. Yeah, it just. Has a heart of has it? Ugh. Oh well. Um, we didn't help at all. I mean, I I'm kind of manic when I sit down and write. Also, other than teaching, is just what I do. I mean, writing is is the thing that um, I don't have kids, so it is the uh, I've got two things in the world. I got my students, who I a lot of them I still am friends with and mentor, and I've got you know what I can scribble and leave behind. And it is, it's a, a day that I don't run. I don't feel that I've, I don't feel like I've left my mark. Check out you know? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Or not. Well, for your, for your audience, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we would. We all want to thank you here. Yeah, I'm sorry about the camera flicking on and off. Um, oh, look, that's okay. Was, yeah, it was fun. Uh, touch with me, and we'll make it happen. Okay. And I'm gonna go online and buy a new camera. I think because this one. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do that because I'll be buying a second book. <laughs> I'll get the. Get down there, okay? Okay. All right. And... Wow, this is so okay. We'll Bye. go ahead and uh, thank okay. you all so much, and thank you, Esther, for all your help today. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I'd like to get in touch with you to see how we can do this with the book. Okay, we will. So you did pre-register, right? So we'll have your email. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. All Thanks right. So thank you guys so right, much. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Robin. We appreciate you. Bye bye.